you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is very informal, so if you want to just interrupt me and object to something or ask a question or anything, let me know. Um, because really, as Andrew said, I I'm, I'm appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm happy for this program you're doing. I love the Olympics. Um, I was lucky to be involved with the Atlanta bid. None of us had any idea what was going on and, and what was going to happen. And uh, it was, it, needless to say, it's really um, a life-changing experience for me. Uh, I always tell people I have a tendency to get a little bit excited or over exuberant about talking about how Atlanta won the game. So if I do that, all I can do is just kind of ask for your patience and your forgiveness. And there's an old South Georgia saying, it's a sorry dog who won't wag its own tail. So, you know, we'll, I'll do the best I can. So uh, I was interested. I wasn't sure if we'd have an older crowd or a younger crowd. I think it's a younger crowd predominantly. So you may don't have it. Uh, I re won't remember necessarily anything about the Atlanta story. The, the Atlanta winning the right to host the Olympics was really kind of a lightning bolt out of nowhere. Uh, and it was something that began uh, as a dream of one lone individual, a gentleman named Billy Payne, who had been an All-American football player at the University of Georgia. He was from Atlanta. He was a lawyer in Atlanta. and. Billy was, his father had died early of a heart attack. Uh, I think he was beginning to worry about his own situation. He was approaching 50, which is when his father died. He had just gotten involved in a fundraising activity for his church to build a new sanctuary. And he sort of woke up and said, I need something else to get involved in. And literally uh, kind of picked up the newspaper and saw that the United States Olympic Committee was interested in whether there were some, whether cities would be interested in bidding for the right to host the 1996 Olympic Games. Uh, that was interesting to me in its own right because number one, 1996 was going to be the 100th anniversary of the modern Olympic Games which were held in Athens, Greece. It was pretty much considered by most people that they would go give those games to Athens, Greece. You even wondered if they would have anybody bid. And so why were they doing this? Um, I think the other thing was that the Olympic Games, this was in 1987, now we're talking about this period of time, and the Games had just three years before been in Los Angeles. And I've, I never have really asked anybody with the USOC, but I've got to think that most of the time, if you're going to win the Olympics, you've got to maybe bid two or three times. Uh, most cities had, have had to do that. Los Angeles had bid three times after the 1932 games before they won the 1984 games, and they really won that because nobody else was interested. Um, you know, they'd been through the boycott of Moscow, you know, those kinds of things. So. Anyway, uh, this was definitely a grassroots movement. It wasn't a lot of bids start by Chamber of Commerce people or government people or this, that, and the other. But Billy instead um, went out to Colorado Springs, found out a little bit about this, thought it was a great idea, and began to talk to a few friends of his, uh, including myself, people that really loved in Atlanta, people who kind of loved the Olympic movement, uh, appreciated the potential it had, uh, and the whole idea of bringing the world to Atlanta, of embracing the Olympic spirit and sharing it with our city. And we decided, you know, why not? We'll bid for the Olympic Games. Um, I, Billy won't admit this. I think really deep down he was thinking, we got to get in the game here and maybe we'll win the games. Athens is probably going to win. But um, like so many things in life, luck and timing came in. And the first stroke of luck he had was that at that time, the mayor of Atlanta was Andrew Young. And Andrew Young is a very visionary a leader, was very active, of course, with Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. And what we didn't know, he grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, but he ran track and field. He was a great fan of the Olympic movement. He idolized Jesse Owens. His daddy had taken him as a child to see films of Jesse Owens. And he really, unlike other people, he kind of saw 
in his mind, a synergy between the peace and friendship and, and the Olympic movement and the idea of social integration and equality of the civil rights movement. He really felt like that th these were movements that had some similarities that inspired him. And he also, as only he can do, came up with a kind of a unique comparison uh, that he used to talk about in 1895. Atlanta had hosted an event called the Cotton States Exposition. And actually, it was an event at that time that where Atlanta was trying to kind of promote itself to the rest of the United States, that we have emerged from the Civil War where Atlanta got destroyed and, and we're here and we're ready to take our place as a great city. And now, 100 years later, what a wonderful opportunity to introduce Atlanta to the, to the world. Uh, I will tell you that none of us ever really thought too much about the magnitude of this event or even the insurmountable odds of winning the bid. It was just a great thing to do. And yeah, we had uh, assets that we felt like would be helpful. We had the world's busiest airport. We were a big convention center. We had a lot of hotel rooms. We had just done a new rapid transit facility. We had athletic facilities. We had a World Congress Center. It was a huge convention center, uh, but I can tell you that we truly uh, didn't know what we didn't know. And uh, the first hurdle for us, of course, was to be selected by the United States Olympic Committee to be their bid city for this cycle. Um, when Billy went to Colorado Springs to see about this, there were about 13 cities that had showed up, but uh, only four uh, then finally initially expressed enough interest to get in the process. Interestingly enough, uh, one of those cities was Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I don't know who was involved and what happened, but the four cities that came down at the end initially were uh, San Francisco, Nashville, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Atlanta. It ended up, they did a process, and, but for a variety of reasons, uh, the, it came down to Atlanta and Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, again, we were kind of going uphill because uh, we knew nobody in the U.S. Olympic movement. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of experience in Olympic sports. You know, we had baseball and football and basketball at, at that time, but we didn't know much about team handball or rowing or badminton or all those kinds of things. Uh, whereas Minneapolis, St. Paul had already hosted an event called the Olympic Festival, which the U.S. Olympic Committee used to have in off Olympic years just for U.S. athletes. They also were well represented on the U.S. Olympic Committee board. And I remember um, our first effort in this was sort of magnified the difference. We, three of us, Billy Payne and a friend of mine, Charlie Schaffer, and I went to Calgary for the 1988 Winter Olympics. We had no tickets, no credentials. We, we did have a hotel room. We were able to get a hotel room. <laughs> we were lucky with that. We didn't really know anybody. And the Minneapolis people were staying in the U.S. Olympic Committee Hotel and the mayors of both Minneapolis and St. Paul were there, hosted receptions. Um, and we were just kind of going around trying to scrounge tickets and see if we could meet somebody. We were lucky in the sense that there was a guy named Harvey Schiller, who at the time was the commissioner of the Southeastern Conference. They were based in Birmingham, and he had gotten to know Billy, and they connected, and he introduced us to some people. And so at least we kind of got a little bit of a start, but that's when we realized that so much of this process had to do with personal relationships. We got even luckier because through no effort of our part, it had just happened, the United States Olympic Committee had their board meeting in Atlanta the next month. So we were able to get this opportunity to host a wonderful reception at our high museum. We had this high school singing group that did a bunch of songs and things and you know it made a tremendous hit on the on the members. So we began to get some momentum with the impact that in April of 1988 uh, Atlanta was selected as a city to bid for these games. 
We, when we thought about the obstacles for that bid, we had even more obstacles, I think, to overcome to win the right to host the games. Uh, number one, uh, as I mentioned, no city had ever won the games on its first bid. Um, L.A., as I said, had bid three times after their games in 32 before they got 84. Barcelona, who was hosting the next game, bid four times before they got those. Again, we had no history of, in Olympic sports. We really had very little international travel. None of our group had ever traveled much internationally. I'd been in the Navy and been to some places like that, but uh, you know that was the extent of it. We really had no foreign language skills. Um, that was a little bit interesting because we did learn that Southern was a foreign language to most of those people, so um, I'll get to that later. W Atlanta was really, you know, Atlanta is good at promoting itself, and, uh, but really, basically, it was an unknown city internationally. Um, m m most people were a little confused about whether we might introduce blackjack because they thought we were Atlantic City, New Jersey. They weren't sure. The other two interesting problems we had was that at the time, this 1988, probably the most famous Georgian that any of these people knew was Jimmy Carter. Well, he had led the boycott of the Moscow game, so we were a little concerned about that. Uh, and maybe the most famous um, sports figure internationally nationally from Atlanta at that time was Ted Turner. Well, at that time, you may recall, because of the boycotts of Moscow and Los Angeles, Ted had started the Goodwill Games, which was, while he, nobody liked to say it, it was sort of in competition for the Olympic Games. So we weren't sure how, how this was all going to work. And when you think about it, it's like, what were we thinking? But I will say from these inauspicious beginnings, we began to to make progress and really the key is I think we listened and we learned. Uh, we listened to IOC members, we listened to people in the Olympic movement, we listened to what their concerns are, we listened to other cities that had won the rights, especially we made great friends with a man in Barcelona who'd been very helpful with their bidding. And we found out that winning the Olympic bid so often is not about stadiums or airports or hotels or weather or transportation or crime statistics or anything. It's about people. Uh, it's about w making friends. It's about winning people's trust and confidence. It's about proving to these people. Uh, you had 88 members of the IOC. We had to get a majority of those votes. And you had to prove to them that you uh, were the people, kind of people that they could entrust their most valuable asset to the Olympic Games to. Uh, we did what I think folks in this part of the country do best, and that's make friends and make them feel at home. Southern hospitality was a real plus for us. And I will tell you that um, the man who, the games after ours were the Sydney games in 2000, and the man who led their winning bid wrote a book called The Bid about how Sydney won the games, and he's got a whole, he's got a chapter in there on Atlanta. And the chapter on Atlanta is entitled Making Friends. And the, there's a lead-in quote to that chapter from Mark McCormick, who, this is a kind of a, a, an old name, but he was probably the first genius of sports marketing in the United States. Uh, and, and the quote is, all things being equal, people buy from their friends. All things being not quite so equal, people still buy from their friends, make friends. And that was the key. So we really didn't have any kind of slick sales campaign. It wasn't like a Chamber of Commerce production effort. We didn't ever criticize the competition. We, we really didn't ask for votes. We just tried to get to know these people and learn from them. And one of the things we always felt like was key is that we were very humble in our approach, which probably unconventional for most American approaches to things. We were lucky George H.W. Bush was president then, so that kind of fit our motif. <laughs> I better not get into politics. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'll always remember there was a British writer that wrote, covered the Olympic movement. He was very skeptical of what we were doing, why we were doing this. But I always loved his definition of our bid which he called the very essence of courtesy, modesty, and efficiency. 
And something that I used to, in, in uh, talking to bid cities and talking to them about bidding for the games, the process has changed so much that a lot of things are different. But one of the things I always told them was resist the temptation to fall in love with yourself. It is so easy to get so caught up in how great your ideas are that you don't pay attention to what people are saying or what they're telling you about it and being realistic about your strengths and your weaknesses and learn and try to build on that. So um, the key to us is that we had, because I said people didn't know about Atlanta, we had to get members to come to Atlanta and show them what we had to offer. And we really began this effort at the Seoul Olympic Games in 1988. Um, we we were, of course, late trying to get anything involved in Seoul. We were able to get some credentials, but it was tough to get hotel rooms. We we're in a foreign culture trying to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to entertain members and take them to dinner and this, that, and the other. So we ended up developing something that we then used all through our campaign called the Atlanta House. And we sent a lady who did a lot of hospitality events in Atlanta over there. She found a house for us to rent. Um, we got the local Hyatt in Atlanta to call the Hyatt in Seoul and they loaned us a bunch of furniture to put in this house. We took the head bellman from the Marriott Hotel, a guy named Albert Smith, known as Smitty, who is one of, he's one of these guys that every city has who's a great ambassador for everybody that comes to the city. And he came to kind of just be the man about it. And we brought in two cooks. Uh, we had two uh, we had two, two, three, two ladies that went to the, uh, you know, we weren't too much in the, uh, the Asian food. We had two ladies who went to the military base there every day to get our food. And so we entertained there uh, every night. And it was a great way, it was a unique thing and a great way to, uh, for us to begin uh, getting to know people. So in the end, we were successful in bringing 65 of the 88 members to Atlanta. And we visited 84 in their home country. The only members we didn't visit uh, were the North Korean member, for obvious <laughs> reasons, uh, Princess Anne, who doesn't accept members. I got a story I can tell. Uh, the member in Kuwait and the member in um, Saudi Arabia. Were you going to ask me a question? Yeah. Um, how did you, how were you able to do this with like, were you a lawyer at the time? Were you ah. <laughs> <laughs> like, how were you able to do all of that? Um, you know, that's a great question, and I probably should have said that. Yeah, we, we were a totally, we never had more than four paid employees. And it ended up, we got started, and as I said, we didn't know what was going on, but we were beginning to travel some. Well, my law firm had, uh, Billy Payne just quit everything. He, he went full time. He had made some money in real estate and just said, I'm going to do this and we're going to make it happen. My law firm had a sabbatical policy where you could take a three month sabbatical. So I took my sabbatical. You know, I'd been working on the bid and doing a lot, but I took it during the Seoul Olympic Games. So I was able to be there uh, for three weeks. But that's it. I ended up taking a, the firm loaned me to the bid committee. I took a year's leave of absence because we really had not focused on what the demands were going to be travel-wise. So, um, anyway, so it was, it, it was amazing. In fact, um, one thing I forgot to tell you uh, about us being an unknown when we got started in the southern accent is that um, Right after we won the designation, some guy came up to Billy and said, listen, um, we, again, we're not sure where we're going to start, what are we going to do. Uh, he said, there's a meeting of all the European Olympic committees in Malta, and you need to go to this meeting. So he immediately, as Billy was wont to do, Charlie, you need to go to Malta. So I was working at a law firm, King & Spaulding at the time, and I sent a this was back in the days of faxes, <laughs> and I sent, a, uh, I sent a fax to the headquarters of the European Olympic Committees in Belgium. And, you know, I said, I'm, hi, uh, you know, I'm with the Atlanta, we're bidding for the Olympics, we'd like to come to your event, blah, blah, blah. Well, I thought it was fairly clear what was going on, but of course that fax went out on King and Spaulding 
letterhead. So when I got to Malta, uh, I got there and they had a big room, conference room with all the European countries. And I kept looking for a little, they had a little placard, you know. And I get to the back and there's a placard there that says King and Spalding. And, uh, and then that night a guy called me and wanted to take me to dinner. He had read the guest list. He ran a sporting goods company in Malta and thought I was with the Spalding Sporting Goods Company. So <laughs> that was kind of where we were starting from. Uh, my other great story from Malta has to do with a Southern accent. The member from Hungary who spoke very good English and was very proud of his English. In fact, t both of his daughters came to school in the United States. He does a great imitation of the first time he met me, which was in Malta, because he said he was walking down the hallway and here comes this guy and I, and I come up to him with a big smile and stick out my hand and I say, hey, how you doing, Charlie Battle, good to see you, how you getting along? And he said he had no idea what I was talking about, <laughs> he couldn't understand any of that. But um, I think, um, again, we began hosting members in town and and the the volunteer i can't emphasize enough and that's why it's a great question because the volunteer effort here was amazing uh, president samaranch who was the ioc president at the time he visited us you know the next february he was going to he always pays a visit and by that time we'd gotten somebody to donate some office space we had a small office in a building and we were going to be ready to go and we realized he was coming and but but we had just now gotten our office space most of us were just working independently out of different places and we needed and we didn't have any furniture or anything like that and we were going to have so one of our uh, volunteers late she backed a moving van up to her house and moved her living room furniture into our office for his visit another <laughs> another great moment we had we always took the ioc members to the martin luther king center and to put a wreath on Martin Luther King's grave, and we were heading out to there for at one point in time, and all of a sudden, it was like a lot of things. It's, nobody had remembered to get a wreath. So these two gals ran down. There was a funeral home about two blocks down. They ran down to the funeral home. They had a nice wreath in the window, and they said, can we borrow this wreath? And so we borrowed the wreath. And yeah, those are the things that you have to do. I, <laughs> I think I talk, I, there are a lot of experiences on the road. Most of my memorable experience have to do with swimming. I'm not big on swimming, but I did go swimming in the Danube River with the granddaughter of the member from what was then Slovakia, and it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. And then the other time, I was actually in Bulgaria and got invited with the member out. He had a Sunday barbecue out by a lake, and they were all going swimming. And they, oh, you got to go swimming. I said, no, I don't have a bathing suit. And they said, oh, we got one. Well, it was kind of this pink colored Speedo. <laughs> and I kept thinking, well, th thankfully, this is before YouTube or social media. <laughs> Nobody's here, and I don't look any worse than your average Bulgarian, I don't think. So uh, a guy wrote an article about that, actually, in New York. He described me as wearing a bathing suit that was better suited for a man half my age and twice my athletic ability, which was about right. Anyway, um, I'm getting distracted. We, um, you know, uh, the great, obviously, besides that, a great asset we had was, uh, was Andrew Young because he was truly an international figure and especially in the African and countries in the Middle Eastern countries. Um, I'll always remember our first presentation to the IOC executive committee, which was in Seoul. They didn't really know us. And there was a gentleman on the executive committee, Judge Kaba and Bai from Senegal. And we made this presentation. They, it was right before lunch. They'd been meeting all day. They were sort of sitting there like, wow, when, who are these people? When is lunch? But after it was over, this judge comes up and introduces himself to Ambassador Young there and says, look, you had, were very helpful to me. He was a member of the World Court in The Hague, and he said, so well, we're like, okay. And about two days later, we had a meeting with the member in Kuwait, who was a member of the royal family. And we sat down to talk with him and start telling him, and, and he, um, some of you all may recall that um, Andy Young was the ambassador to the United Nations, and he got in trouble 
because he had a secret meeting with the Palestinians, uh, which probably was the right thing to do, but not the politically right thing to do, and he had to resign. And uh, that position, this is before he had, he had been a congressman and then done that, and then he became mayor. And the guy from Kuwait said, Ambassador, I just want you to know that my people will never forget what you did and how you tried to help in that situation, and I can assure you I will vote for Atlanta. This was really the first person that ever said anything. Now, the bad news is that uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait about three weeks before the vote, and this guy got killed. So he was our one vote. That, anyway, um, so uh, I will say another thing uh, that was a challenge for us. As, as I said, we, we had to really kind of separate ourselves from Los Angeles. The games had just been in the United States four or five years before. and. Truthfully, we, we almost seceded from the Union again. We kind of tried to act like this is a whole different part of the world down here. We're an unknown and unique part of the country. But what we always told people that seemed to work is that Atlanta is farther from Los Angeles than Barcelona is from Moscow. But anyway, for whatever reason, again, there, I can't give, say enough about the luck and timing. Um, we were up against five other cities, and for various reasons, I'll, I'll get to Athens, the key one, but you know, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, well, that was really a non-starter. That was kind of the old Eastern Bloc, just sort of saying they had to be somewhere. Manchester, England. Well, the English tried several times before they figured out for the 2012 games, they're not going to give the games to England unless it's London. Now, Birmingham had bid. They weren't going to give the games to Manchester. Melbourne, Australia. We were scared that the, that the Australians were going to nominate Sydney, and they probably should have. And of course, Sydney went on to win the next games. But if they were going to go back to Australia, it was more likely they were not going back to a city where they'd already been in 1956. So that helped. And then, of course, it was Athens who made it to the final round with us. And the problem is the Athens people were just the opposite of what I talked about being humble. They were arrogant. They almost demanded that you have to give us the games. They didn't try to go about trying to give some other unique reasons. They demanded the games. So as a result, and, and then Toronto, which really in a lot of ways was our toughest composition, competition because they were the most like us in that they were a North American city, going to do it privately, had a lot of facilities, had a lot. And the leader of their bid was, the, um, was an Olympic sailor. He ended up being the president of the Sailing Federation. So the problem is they, they got involved with some protests, as so many cities do. People, they had a group called Bread Not Circuses that got going up there. You know, the great thing about Atlanta is we never really had any protests till we won because people just kind of like, this is fun. We're bidding for the Olympics, and they didn't think we were going to win, so they weren't going to take the time. We had to deal with some of that after we won the games. Uh, but I'll always remember uh, there was a great sports writer in Atlanta named Furman Bisher, and he was the only Atlanta sports writer who had ever covered the Olympics. And he kind of was bemused by this bid. He thought this was very interesting and this was all well and good, but he didn't really follow it too much. Uh, he mainly just liked to go to the Olympic Games. That was his main. He didn't really follow the Olympics during the entire quadrennium period. And I never will forget we're in Tokyo where the final vote was and we had a little hospitality area. He came, came up there with this sort of look on his face and he said, you know something? I've been talking around the press room. Y'all might win this thing. And so that was a good sign. But anyway, uh, the bottom line was we won. And the other bottom line is there's no way we would ever win in the current environment because of the scandals that erupted after the Salt Lake bid, the money that's spent and everything else. You now, uh, members cannot visit the bid city. You cannot visit the members in their home country. And it's interesting that these are all you know, things that I think make some sense, but they end up costing cities almost more money. Everybody thinks that the whining and dining of IOC members is, is the most expensive thing. But now, because you can't do those things, everybody's hiring 
PR firms. They're making these exotic videos and doing all kinds of things like that. Uh, which, and, and to tell you the truth, I, I think there's more temptation for corruption in that environment too, because there's, you don't have this, we're trying to make friends. It gets to be a little bit of a different, a whole kettle of fish. So anyway, we won. And again, um, now we had less than six years to organize the games. None of us knew, um, none of us could imagine the magnitude of that event. And I mean, you all know that. I think it's, it's been said it's like hosting 26 world championships in 16 days. People have said it's like putting on six Super Bowls. It's, uh, and, and you know, it's amazing when you think about the event, the preparation and all that goes into it. And now they have over seven years. Uh, there's a, uh, it, we always used to compare it of six years of preparation for 16 days. It was like what Jesse Owens said about winning the gold medal in the 100 meters in Berlin. It's a lifetime of training for just 10 seconds. But, um, and the other thing that was interesting is obviously, uh, you know, Andy Young, it only, we only got him to agree for all of his enthusiasm to, to bid for the games if we promised him there wouldn't be any taxpayer liability, that we would be able to do this with private money. And so that was our biggest challenge, but we felt some comfort in the Los Angeles model, that they had been able to do this in 1984 and end up actually with a significant surplus. Well, that was very misleading because uh, in many ways the Atlanta games were twice as big as the Los Angeles games, and we were doing it in a city about one-third the size. Um, we had 58 more countries involved than they did, uh, predominantly because there was no boycott and the Soviet Union had collapsed into several. We had almost twice as many athletes, 10,800 to their 6,400. Biggest challenge, twice as many media. They had about 10,000 accredited media. We had almost 20,000. Uh, four times the budget. You know, they did their games for about a half million dollars. Uh, ours were almost two billion dollars. There was, and the IOC, there was no guidebook. There was nothing that tells you. How. They sort of just throw it out there and say, here, go for it, and then start asking for you to spend a lot of money for stuff they, they want you to do. Uh, so, that was without question, as complicated as the event is and as much work as it takes and everything, our biggest challenge was just making sure that we were able to raise enough money privately to put on the games. And the big problem with that was um, now they require a government guarantee. And the, the good thing about a government guarantee is that you know, it enables you to spend your money in a rational way, to plan and do things, uh, you know, as they need to be done. We were in a position where we really couldn't spend money unless we knew we had it. And this really came to the fore and actually cost us in revenues when it came to the TV rights. Because the biggest expenditure we had was our Olympic Stadium. And that was about a $325 million dollar stadium that we were going to have to build and in order to get started on that we needed to get a line of credit with the bank and in order to get a line of credit we had to have that much money committed so the only way we were ever going to get anything close to that initially was to do the tv rights and u.s tv rights are huge but their, the experience in barcelona in 92 had not been that good we were coming in right it was in life there's a lot of timing in when you do these TV negotiations. And we ended up with a nice television contract, uh, but probably not nearly as much as we would have gotten if we could have waited another year. So that was always uh, tough. But in the end, um, you know, it was, it was a great experience, a great event. Um, I always have to acknowledge that, that things weren't perfect. There are always things that go wrong. Obviously, you all recall that we had a bombing uh, in the park uh, where um, a, a lady died and a journalist had a heart attack running to get to the bombing, which was a tra And you know, it was, that was one of those tough decisions because I, you know, when I talk about it, the biggest legacy of our games has been Centennial Olympic Park. Uh, and 
the big decision, I mean, this became a wonderful gathering space, obviously, during the games, and the big decision for that park was, should we make that a secured event, put a whole fence around it, have a mag and bag, make people do all this, and we decided that that would kind of defeat the purpose, and of course, you can now say in hindsight, but, um, you know, it, they came very close to catching that before it went. But, you know, t to me, there was a <clears throat> one of Andy Young's greatest speeches was when we reopened the park two days later, because even after the bombing, we had more volunteers show up the next morning than were supposed to show up. People really came back and said, we are not going to let this stop the game. So that was a tremendous uh, thing to show that kind of commitment and that kind of spirit uh, about the games. Um, you know, we, we were criticized for over commercialism. Unfortunately, our city government never quite understood that we had to raise money and we had to help our sponsors and we had to promote things that the sponsors who were finding and they couldn't understand why they weren't going to make a lot of money off these games and we were like look this, this is just a great event for the city so they let they let a contract out to a gentleman <clears throat> who promised them about three or four million dollars if he would license vendors along the streets in Atlanta so unfortunately and not as bad as the media wanted to make it but that gave a certain flea market look to the, that the media loved to jump on and it was unfortunate because we had done a lot to beautify downtown Atlanta and to do some things and they never made near a lot of them didn't do well at all because it was an ill-conceived idea and of course the other thing that hurt us with the media was we we had, uh, you may remember the 90s was maybe one of the most active decades of technology development. I mean, we were going from big old heavy phones to other phones. The internet was just coming in. And IBM was going to give us a state of the art technology system for results. What we should have done is what had always worked at the prior games. We don't need to be the state of the art. So we went through some snafus there and, and we paid the price for it with the media. You know, everybody always thinks that for your Olympic Games, and it is true, I mean, I don't mean to belittle it, they, that, that the athletes are the most important people at the games, and they really are. But if you're worried about your image for your games and how, how your games are going to be remembered, the media are the most important people. You've got to take care of the media and we probably could have could have done that better. But all in all, um, it's a, certainly a, a, great, a great moment in my life. I think the positives certainly outweigh the negatives. I think there's no doubt that the most memorable moment uh, for so many people from our games is Muhammad Ali lighting the flame. I, I'm amazed that we were able to keep that a secret. I think three people knew it and we held on, but it was, a, it was, it was really bigger than I even imagined it was going to be. And I know there was a speaker here earlier talking about Muhammad Ali, but that was a great moment. I will tell you on a personal level that one of my great moments in the Olympic Games, I happened to be in charge of medal ceremonies, and it was decided, you know, Muhammad Ali had either thrown away or lost or for whatever reason, and pro he did no longer had his Olympic medal from the 1960 Olympics in Rome. So it was decided that they were going to give him a 1960 medal. And this was, this was interesting, and, but it was kind of done at the last minute, and we didn't have a 1960 medal, and they, were, they had one in Lausanne, Switzerland, you know, this, when they could get it here. We ended up, we got lucky, they had one in a museum at the Coca-Cola Company. They're the biggest long-term sponsor of the Olympics. So I never will forget, um, the other thing that got to be a little controversial is, of course, TV runs everything and NBC decided that it would be best to award this medal at halftime of the Dream Team final basketball game because that would be a huge crowd and of course this 
totally irritated the boxing people, understandably, because he had won his medal in boxing. But we had to arrange a little sum. I never will forget, I was in my, I wish I had a picture of this, if I had any pictures of anything. Uh, this medal came over in a little box from the Coca-Cola company, and I can rem and it, had, it was kind of crumpled up, and I can remember ironing the ribbon in my hotel room. And then we got over there and got some of the metal people and Samaraj Gate, which was, it, it, you know, it was a great moment anyway. And then, and he had, he had ridden down, he, you know, he was, was suffering from Parkinson's and couldn't move real well. He had come down in, in a motorized cart. And then President Samaranch, who gave him the medal, and I were going back to a freight elevator to go back up, and in he came. And I'll never forget, uh, he came riding into the elevator and he kissed his medal. It was, uh, those are wonderful moments, but anyway, that's too much. <laughs> but, um, you know, we had great sports competitions. We had full venues. Uh, we had a festive atmosphere. People had a good time. I've never, for all the problems, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who went to the Atlanta Olympics that didn't have a good time. Uh, at the time, we sold almost nine million tickets, which was the most ever sold until London. London finally sold almost 10 million. We actually sold more tickets to women's events than Barcelona, the prior games, had sold to all events. Um, and we, we got a lot of new sports facilities and we had good use of temporary facilities. And I think we were, you know, we were, we were creative in the sense that um, we converted things into another unit. You know, our Olympic Stadium was made into a Braves Stadium. And, you know, it is now to make that we were a little worried because the Braves were going to leave, but it's now the football stadium for Georgia State. So it continues to be a good letter. The only white leg is white elephant that we ended up with was tennis. We did the tennis out at Stone Mountain and they just never could quite get any synergy to make, it's a, it's a big event and that didn't work. So, um, you know, we're, we're proud of what we did. We're proud of the Atlanta Olympic Games. It was a wonderful moment for our city and for all the people of our city. And <clears throat> the good news is we did come through under budget. We had about a $2 million surplus left over. It was close, but we made it. And we ended up with, with wonderful legacies. I, as I said earlier, our biggest legacy is the park. The park has become an ever-improving uh, space now, uh, you, and they've just finished another great improvement to it. Um, and but what it's really been is a catalyst for over two billion dollars of investment around that area. Now you've got the aquarium, the World of Coke, the National Civil Rights and Human Rights Museum, the College Football Hall of Fame, all of those things. We did major infrastructure improvements. You know, Atlanta had had two bond issues for infrastructure that had failed. And after we won the right to host the Olympics, we had another bond issue vote and it passed. Uh, we, we did a lot in the housing area. We built all the housing for the Olympic Village for dormitories that were for Georgia State initially and they're now at Georgia Tech. But they really were a catalyst for Georgia State, which used to be totally a commuter university, has now become the biggest university in Georgia. They've got 55,000 students and massive uh, housing downtown. Uh, we did a wonderful mixed-use public housing complex right, right by the park. Techwood Homes had been the first public housing project in the United States. President Roosevelt dedicated it in the 30s, but it had unfortunately really become a rundown, crime-ridden, terribly dilapidated place. And we were able to get the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development to really redo it totally as a model for mixed-use housing, which we then did all over the city. We changed the face of downtown. I think we did a lot of things that provided more housing downtown and reversed the outbound trend of people uh, from downtown. And, I, you know, we enhanced really Atlanta's position as a major sports capital in the United States. We've, <clears throat> we've hosted, since the Olympics, three Super Bowls, four Final Fours. We've had the college football championship. We now have the FedEx Cup championship every year. We've had all-star games in every sport. So it's been a huge, and now 
The biggest thing in Atlanta is our soccer team that's playing there, so that's been good. We had tremendous employment opportunities for women and minorities uh, during the Olympic Games, and probably a total economic impact of about five billion dollars. But but still, to me, uh, the, maybe the biggest legacy is that we provided a, a wonderful memories for the city, for people in the city. And you know, I remember when we first started this, a guy from Boston who was on the USOC told me, he said, you know, the greatest thing about hosting the Olympic Games is what he called the afterglow, that you'll always be in Olympic City. And it always makes me feel good to have people come up sometime, even 20, three years later and say what a wonderful moment that was and what an exciting time for our city so all I can say is uh, people ask uh, was it worth it and it absolutely was uh, I know you all are getting ready to have a presentation about Rio and the question of was it worth it and I will admit the Olympics are going through a challenging time because it is a hard decision and it is hard and cities spend way too much money now and don't do it wisely um, Andrew shared with me an article that Christine Brennan wrote in USA Today yesterday about that many cities end up in frustration disorganization white elephants and red ink and this has become especially true for the Winter Olympics because the Winter Olympics even are smaller but have some huge expenses involved, things like bobsled runs and this, that, and the other. And she has an interesting uh, recommendation that uh, she thinks they ought to rotate around to major cities that have hosted the games uh, for three years and then maybe every fourth Olympiad give it to a new city. There's been a lot of talk about that. I still think it's something that's worthwhile. You just have to plan it right. You have to be realistic about what you can do and what you need to do. I think the IOC was brilliant in giving the next two summer games at one time to Paris and Los Angeles. And, and, I, and I really hope they may do that with the winter games if they can keep Stockholm in. They need to go back to Europe. And I tell you who's waiting in the wings and who's ready to do it is Salt Lake City. And they could maybe do something like that. Frankly, uh, I hope nobody from the IOC watches this, but... <laughs> What they ought to do is really, the event has gotten so big and so complex and the whole movement is so different that they ought to just not have the members vote on it. It ought to be more of an executive decision to me about realistically how does this fit into the city's plans. And the IOC is trying to do this. They're trying to emphasize legacy. They're trying to emphasize good management on this. They're trying to, they're, they're, they need, they're given more money to cities and they need to. The IOC has got a lot of money and they earn a lot of money and they ought to be more helpful if they want to keep it going. But these are all my personal opinions about it. But anyway, uh, thank you all. You've been very patient. You've been very kind. I appreciate you letting me take a walk down memory lane to remember all this. I got here a little early this morning and so I rode by the Parthenon. I was hoping I'd kind of get inspired by <laughs> for the Olympics by seeing it. I'm not sure it did, but uh, but it's it was great. Uh, it was a great moment in my life. I'll always cherish the memories that I have, and I'm glad to answer any questions anybody may have. <clears throat> yes, sir. Oh, well, ladies, that's yeah. That's right. It's old. <laughs> I, I have great memories there. My husband and I went um, in, with our then young teenagers, but did George Clinton ever have for their housing? You mentioned George's state, but who did the George? Um, it, they, what happened is the state built that, um, and we we provided the equity funding and they issued a bond to do it so we put up that and they built it for Georgia State but then Georgia State began building dormitories on their own and so Georgia Tech took it over so they now have it. It was part of Georgia State during the Olympics and of course our village was at Georgia Tech but now it's part of Georgia Tech and Georgia State has all kinds of new, new uh, facilities downtown that are their dormitories. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, uh, actually, I worked at the Olympics. Wonderful. Good for you. And, and uh, I 
I'm really from Georgia anyway. Good. I lived in, I lived in Atlanta around that time. When I lived, when I where, was, where did you work? What were you doing? I worked at the shoe shop, the rifle range. Okay, out of Wolf Creek. Okay, well, good for you. Well, thank you. Yeah. My question is that uh, in between that time, you know, bears changed with they had yeah. Jackson in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was, I, I'm so glad you asked that because I was thinking as I got down to the end of it that I should have mentioned that. We were not only lucky to have Andrew Young, we were lucky to get Maynard Jackson because, um, and I, I was fortunate enough to go on the first, right after he was elected, he and I went to Mexico City to introduce him. And, and the transition was seamless. I mean, he was just as enthusiastic, he was just as supportive, he's just as eloquent, you know, he's a larger than life figure. So th that transition was, was terrific for all of us. It was, and I'll tell you the other, um, the other great thing about Mayor Jackson is that, you know, he, when we won, he kind of had visions of maybe taking it over and running it, and that probably wasn't going to work. But and we went through various things that he just wanted to do something, and we might have. But any time the decision was made, he stood behind it. Um, his successor, unfortunately, wasn't always that easy. But but he would he would always stand behind it because he loved the city of Atlanta, and he wanted this to succeed. And so that, I'm glad you asked that question because it was really uh, a seamless transition. Charlie, how important was it that Coke is based in Atlanta? You know, um, of course, the Athens people thought that they bought the games or something, yeah. you know, this, that, and the other. Uh, I will say, and I can say this without question, r without really, shamelessly almost, the last place Coke wanted the games was Atlanta because Coke owns Atlanta. This is a marketing opportunity for them. So they want the games to go to Beijing because they're three billion Chinese that they want to sell Cokes to. Now, you know, they made a big point to contribute, they made some contribution to every bid city in our cycle. And they were, they were conscious of all that, they were worried about it. In fact, they made up a little plaque that had the, that you could get as a souvenir that had the Coke logo and then the bid pin, bid pin from all five cities. So they gave as much to, uh, uh, and of course, and it, it ended up that it, in a way it maybe even cost them a little more money because they felt obligated to build that Coca-Cola exhibit. They always did a pin trading center, but they did even more. So, as I said, they, um, yeah, that was that was not a factor. Didn't hurt, probably. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You kind of touched on this briefly, but once you got, um, Atlanta got the rights to host the Olympics, how much support did you get from the IOC? Because you kind of mentioned that once you got it, they were kind of like, well, here you go. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, they, they are supportive. Uh, the, the thing that I always, and of course they have a coordination commission that comes to, to watch your progress and, and this, that, and the other. Uh, they're, they're much more active now in trying to get involved, and, and that's probably, that can be a two-edged sword. Sometimes you just want them to get out of town so you can get your job done, but in effect they've got a lot more expertise there. What unfortunately happened was it, that we felt like Number one, they added two sports to us, which was going to cost us money. Then they told us we needed to build a doping thing. You know, there was always stuff like that. But I don't want to make too much of an issue out of that. I mean, they, they're supportive. They're not necessarily uh, that helpful in that they, you know, they're, they're, they're just there to kind of tell you what you ought to do and this, that, and the other. So, and it's, and it's more different now. I think they try to get much more involved. And, and they have, you know, I don't know whether they need it or not. When we bid for the games, I think the staff of the IOC was maybe 35 or 40 people. It's now 800. So it's like everything else. It's a, it's a whole different operation. But. <clears throat> How much money did, uh, did the state of Georgia actually put in? Because you know they were saying that it was all going to be volunteer, but then well, a lot of it came out too. No, you know, not directly. You know, we talk about how we did it.
privately. Now, there was money spent. Mainly the federal government spent money on security. And that always is. They do that if you host the Democratic Convention or the, you know, the Super Bowl or anything like that. The state helped with like the financing of those dormitories, but they didn't, you know, it wasn't like they made a direct contribution of anything. Sadly, we used to laugh that, the, that our government help was directly inversely proportional to how close you were. We got the most from the federal government, second from <laughs> Georgia, and the least from the city. The city, <clears throat> was, and I don't blame them, the city is tough because we had to enter into a contract with them. They made us pay them for using the police force and security and this, that, and the other, and that was something you had to heavily go. And I, and I don't blame them, but it was, you know, we were, we were, as I said, struggling all along the way. But basically, uh, you know, we were fortunate that the support was there all along. So the final vote was in Tokyo? Was final the, vote was in Tokyo. Was, was the decision already made at that point, or did you do a big no, presentation? No, we did it. Did no. Um, good. We did, we did, you know, it's interesting, now you can watch it on television. And they actually, you do a presentation, and they actually have the vote on television. And, you know, it's like a lot of things. They eliminate, they vote until somebody gets a majority. They throw out the lowest one. In ours, we made the presentation, and then you watch the others, and then they sit in a room and do the whole thing, and then walk out. Now, we had a wonderful lady who was very supportive of us. I feel sorry for her because she lives in Venezuela. She's about 96 now. But she, so when they came out, she told us that depending on what side of her neck her scarf was on, <laughs> whether we made the finals. Even the members don't know. What happens is they vote till they get down to the two, and then they vote, and then nobody says anything. Even the members don't know until the announcement. So all she knew was that we had made that, but when she came out, we at least knew that. And then, and then they, all, they all march out. And yeah, it was, it was an interesting, the vote cycle is interesting, and I, I didn't say this, which is very important. The most important thing in this is you gotta survive the first round, but then you wanna be everybody's second choice. So it's, you know, you, it's not like you, some guy says, well, I'm gonna vote for Melbourne, and well, you say, well, great, well, look, you know, keep us in mind, that kind of thing, because, and, it, and of course, these people, <laughs> there's one member who swears that she was able to successfully vote for every city one time, so she could <laughs> tell all of them she voted for them, you know, because you can, like, okay, we had one round, Belgrade went out. At the end of the first round, um, Athens was ahead. You know, it was like 23 to 19 to 17 to 14 to 11 to 5. Uh, Belgrade had 5. The second round, Manchester went out, but Melbourne went ahead of us. They, they, we ended up gaining like two votes. They ended up ahead of us. So they were second. We were third, Toronto. The next round, Melbourne went out. So again, it was like somebody wanted to be able to look somebody in Melbourne. <laughs> Yeah, and say I voted for you. Then Toronto went out, and we beat we beat uh, Athens fifty-one to thirty-five in the final vote. <clears throat> Did you make a movie or a documentary about that? No, sadly, no. And nobody's written a book. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's right. No, no, that's right. It's uh... yes, ma'am. About. For their bid? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, this just happened then the timing, because you said now, you know, all the PRs. You know. Yeah. i tell you, Rio, <clears throat> I, w I actually was consulting with Chicago, mm -hmm. who was bidding f for that cycle. And that was tough, because at the time, there was no chance, because the USOC and the IOC were crosswise on a variety of issues. But Rio did a magnificent job of parlaying the first games in South America. That was what they were really able to do, that, that it's been to all these continents and it's never been uh, to South America. Interestingly enough, 
uh, Andrew mentioned that I'd been on the evaluation commission and went to 11 cities one time that were bidding for the 2004 games. At that time, both Rio and Buenos Aires were bidding, and Buenos Aires was much the better bid at that time. This was in 1997. In fact, uh, they made the finals that year. The final five cities that year were Athens, Rome, Cape Town, um, Buenos Aires, and somebody else. Stockholm. Yeah. Yeah, they were much the better bid, but they never they didn't know how to promote it. Buenos Aires is a fantastic city and they've just done a good job hosting the youth Olympic Games. But uh, anyway, so it's all interesting. When they're voting, do they vote on the criteria? Like, do they get a list and vote each bid individually, like say like transportation? No, no, they, or is it just it's just city. Just yeah, the yeah, city? they, <clears throat> and now it's done electronically. Yeah, they just push a button for some city and then, and you know, you really can watch all this on television. Um, you can see it unfold and then they say, okay, um, Chicago's out. And you know, one of the crazy things, it, it can be, I, I, I talked about, we were talking about 20, London won in 2012. Everybody thought Paris was going to win. They didn't do, London had a much better bid. They had a great big leader in Sebco who was an icon in the Olympic movement. But Madrid was sort of the dark horse. And, um, you know, who was, Moscow. Moscow went out, this is when New York was bidding. Moscow went out first. Then New York went out and then Madrid lost by one vote and one of the IOC you had it he he went on and wanted to re-vote because he said he'd voted he'd made a mistake that he had hit the wrong button and they lost the Olympics by I, yeah I mean it's possible you don't know who he pushed and what happened but they wouldn't let him re-vote and I'm convinced that it was a Madrid vote that then went to London and then London wow. or maybe went to Paris anyway yeah it's that's what's a little scary is when you think about <laughs> that's why I'm saying the decision you know it's just a different time point in time now that it probably needs to be a little less whimsical if you want to know the truth the way Nashville is growing I could see that there would be maybe a community effort here yeah. in 20 years or something to try sure to, like what are the things that a city that what you know about Nashville like what do we not have like international I, flights or Enough hotels, or what are the things? I see. I don't know what all you've we got there. Yeah, no. Somewhere. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what your facilities are. The there's, you know, the biggest problem of any Olympic Games is transportation, because no city has built to do that. One of the things that was an outgrowth, really, of the Atlanta Games, and then is this idea of Olympic lanes. You know, they now do Olympic lanes, but. Um, yeah, it's, well, well, but but I'm saying you've got to, um, you know, you, you, I don't know what, you've got to have a certain number of hotels. I mean, they've, they've got requirements now as far as hotels. And then, you know, it's obviously, do you have a big convention center or anything? Yeah, yeah we just built a good yeah. convention center, but we don't have public transportation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, see, that'd be tough. Um, and, you know, what I wish we had done in retrospect is created a media village uh, because it makes it a little bit easier because that's where, I tell you what was ironic in talking about issues in the media, because the media killed us really uh, in a lot of ways about a lot of things, but um, it, it ended up the park, which is by far our greatest legacy, which was really an afterthought. Nobody thought about that park until we'd been to a couple of other Olympic Games and seen what happened. It didn't start till 1993. But the park was in this area that was old abandoned warehouses and unused businesses and not much going on. But it was right between a building called the Inforum, which is this big convent, which was, which was our main press center, and the World Congress Center, which was our media, our uh, TV center. So that was going to be our transportation hub. And so it was going to be perfect because the media kind of goes in and out from there, and that was going to be our hub. Well, when we built the park, we then had to move the transportation hub 
to the Civic Center parking lot, which was about two or three miles away. And that was just enough of a skip to really screw things yeah. up. I tell you the other thing that we didn't realize, we thought we were so lucky because we had like 16 venues in this you know, mile and a half radius. Well, truth be known, that's probably too much. You know, you gotta think about moving people and what all that means as far as getting people you know, in and out. Uh, I was thinking, I know you had a session on flags and anthems. I was, thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about great moments. And, and of course, how important, when I think about it, because I was in charge of victory, it was one of the things I was in charge of. That's probably one of the places where you have your biggest margin of error. And the worst thing that could happen is if you do something wrong, because you're dealing with nations and their national pride and everything. And the, uh, one of the <laughs> tensest moments I had was um, we had had a meeting of all the National Olympic Committees in Atlanta in 1994. And we had gotten them, we had played their anthem for them, we'd showed their flag, we'd done all this and gotten them to sign off on everything. Well, you will recall that 19, early 90s was when apartheid was falling in South Africa and everything was changing. And we had gotten all that done. Well, and it ended up, they went through several transitions of their national anthem. And they finally ended up with kind of a combination of an older one and a more real African one. But um, we, we, we had a ceremony at the village for every team when they got there. And I got a call from the guy and he said, look, we've just changed what we're doing anthem-wise. And you know, this one you play is gonna be, it's okay, but it's really not what's the best. And I was like, oh me, well, this is pre-now with technology. So the only place we could find a copy of this was the embassy of South Africa in Washington. And it ended up, they had a great swimmer then. And swimming was coming up and she was gonna be in the final. There was a good chance she was gonna win it. And I remember I, I had to get, we had to get this, we, and we got NBC, we got the logo to get their NBC affiliate to go to the embassy to get this thing, to get it wired shipped down here, to put it in a car. And I was sitting in my office watching this race, and the, the car is on the way. It's going to be there. <laughs> and it finally made it. But, the time for the yeah, ceremony? for the ceremony. But, uh, and I, I, I could wear you out with stories. My other funny anthem story, truthfully, is. We had the uh, United States anthem played by an army band. Okay, it's the Star Spangled Banner. Now we know there are lots of play. <laughs> I got a call. You know, they, we had a command center. You know, they would refer calls. But this lady called in and said, "Y'all are playing the national anthem incorrectly. It's our national anthem." I was like, "Really?" I said, "Okay." And she went into this whole thing and said, "It's you know." She quoted me the Congressional Act that does it and said, I'll send you a copy, and she started humming. Well, she was exactly right. Yeah, the, <laughs> the second phrase of our name is, it, it goes, dun, da, 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 da. That second one, well, we were going, da, da, da. We were doing quarter notes instead of a three-quarter note and an eighth note, and she was exactly right. <laughs> yeah, and I finally had to call her up, and I said, ma'am, look. I'm sorry. I hope you can live with <laughs> yeah. this. I said it's. <laughs> it was an eighth note. Yeah, just a lady who was an expert called in, and I said, "Well, we're just because I told her. I said, you know, I, I've heard, you know, I've heard 25 different versions of anyway. So. All right, Jalen. The last question. Yes, sir. That's okay. Boy, we probably didn't do as good a job as we could have. Um, and you know, um, and we, <laughs> I, when I think about that, we tried to, in the opening ceremonies, do some things. And what I'll always remember is, and it was kind of hard because we got this big producer from Los Angeles, Don Misher, who had done things he had been involved in. And, and we tried to kind of talk to him, but as you can imagine, there was a sensitivity there about what do you, I mean, you don't want to show the old South. What do you want? You want to emphasize hospitality. You, you've got a lot of 
tension there. But for some reason, they came up with something that had a bunch of pickup trucks coming in. <laughs> Not, I know that doesn't sound like culture, but, it, but and I can't remember exactly. I had to go back and watch it. But everybody said, um, you know, is this the image we want? I mean, this just sounds like a bunch of rednecks down here and what's going on. And we, and we got Andy Young into a meeting and Andy said, go for it. I like it. But I don't have a, a good answer. We, we had a lot of, we had a, I think, a great cultural Olympiad with a variety of arts and shows and things like that. And, you know, there was a good bit of that involved, but that was a little bit of everything. But, yeah, I don't, I, it, was, it, was, it was tough, though. I will tell you that we were, you know, we weren't sure how you all tried to dramatize everything. Because as you probably weren't, I mean, I, I said a Andy Young was the best one at, at really comparing Atlanta as a center for civil rights to the Olympic movement and human rights and all that. He could do that. The other amazing thing Andy Young did, and I'll, <laughs> I'll quit on my stories. I told you about our presentation in Seoul when we were introducing ourselves. And we got in there, it was 12 o'clock, they were running late, we had about 10, and no, they didn't know any of us, they, yeah, Atlanta, who are these people? And you never know what Andy's going to say, because he never has a speech, he just, it's, he's just amazing. And he started talking about Atlanta, and he all of a sudden, he said, and Atlanta, Georgia, is the only American city ever to be destroyed by war. Well, I would have never thought of that, but these people from Europe and around, all of a sudden they were like, whoa, really? Because, you know, they think we're all fat, dumb, and happy over here and nothing ever. It was, I said, how does he come up with stuff like that? <laughs> it's interesting. Anyway. Well, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's been my pleasure. You know, Christy, Christy was a coach.